Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the first time I've been to the McGill Summer School, but it's not the first time I've been to Glenties. The first time I was in Glenties, I was 17 years of age, and we came to Donegal Town to play rugby. And a friend of mine got a very bad gash in his head, and I let him off the pitch, and somebody from the Donegal rugby team says, he'll need a stitch. He put us in a car, and drove us to that very famous hospital, the Central Hotel. <laughs> Walked into the Central Hotel, up to this very learned-looking man, who asked us to be one to paint. I thought, a pint of blood for him and a pint for me. <laughs> And he says, oh, I'll put a few stitches in that for you. So as the first stitch was being applied, my friend turned around to this man, 50s or 60s, and says, how long have you been a GP? He says, I'm not a GP, I'm a vet. <laughs> so some of, you, some of you may know who that man was. The next day, of course, we thought we'd go and do a bit of fishing, and every time we went to go and fish somewhere, Somebody told us we couldn't fish. You can't fish here, you can't fish here, you can't fish here, you can't fish here. So we packed it in, went back to the pub, walked into the pub, and somebody was singing, only the rivers run free. <laughs> so as with those stories, we can't take all things that are cultural and judge them at the level at which we observe them. Recur in this era of post-truth reminds us that we can never get rid of myth nor take it at face value. Myth will always be with us, but we must always approach it critically. As Rukur reminds us, there is a requirement to direct opposition to myth, as myth's power is to subvert and to control. So tonight we're talking about the whole process of hearts and minds, and we're talking about how to achieve a new and agreed Ireland. And I think the first thing we would do if we're looking at the whole question of a new and agreed Ireland is let's take a stock take of where we are today. I think it's too simple that if we just have a united Ireland, that we will resolve the cultural and political disagreements that we have. But it's also clear in the present political disposition in Northern Ireland that we are not achieving the type of progress that we should be advancing. But I think if we do take a stock take of culture and identity, it tells us something more than most of us actually think about. The first thing that has happened in Northern Ireland since 1994 has been the decline in sectarianism. We have new sets of values and approaches which are emerging. Mixed marriages are at an all-time high. Around a quarter of all people in Northern Ireland who are in, mixed, who are in marriages or long-term relationships are now constituting a significant part of our population. Nearly a third of a million people in the last census stated that they were not religious. And workplace segregation is continuing to decline. On this side of the border, we would never have any cover-ups like the Tune Baby scandal. We have had rights given to sexual minorities and, importantly, rights given to women to control their bodies. Both places have changed, and the lack of recognition of that change is a barrier to actually all of us standing back and declaring that we are living in a much better place. The doom-laden are generous with their negativity. Indeed, they offer unevidenced readings of society, and we get that for free. They're happy to engage their unidimensional view. They tell us that sectarianism is worse than it is. They push every negative event, every tweet, every tweet and every social media comment into a knee-jerking world that at times they even get public funding to tell us how wonderfully isolated their culture is. The facts of intercommunity partnership, marriage, and all of the positives noted above tell us that those people are on the slippery ground on which they stand. To maintain such a cognitive dissonance of change and betterment in society is to swim against the positive tide. How could things not be better? The decline in violence and opening up of opportunities to interact across the divide has shifted many of us to a much more positive place. For the guardians of identity misery, a desolation remains fixated upon a selective past and an attempted constant attempt to present everything as if it is negative. McGill summed up what is largely an intergenerational difference. If there's one thing that has changed in our society, it has been that there is a generation who didn't go up in the conflict. How could they not think and behave differently? McGill wrote, I speak of the children of the many townlands, blossoms of the bogland, flowers of the folly, who know not yesterday nor tomorrow. 
We must never forget that the guardians of identity misery are its entrepreneurs, who more than others seem to only adore yesterday at the cost of the freedom of tomorrow. Their, their position is always static and sits contrary to the tens of thousands of intercommunity projects that have appeared and sustained themselves in Northern Ireland. Intercommunity projects are for movement, they're for imagination, they're for recasting the relationships that we have between us. That leadership for change is about removing the pernicious drip of a sectarian past. So if we have a takeaway from tonight, and if we, we think about the whole hearts and minds strategy and what a new Ireland would mean, we need to locate that positivity and we need to place it much more firmly in the public sphere. We need greater media endorsement of it. Why are we not rallying behind the courageous who lead intercommunity exchange? Such courage invokes Martin Luther King's pr proposition that the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. To infuse civic and political leadership, we must turn to a judgment of people not by their identity, but by the content of their character. In undertaking this stop take, we must also answer the question, are we an evolving post-conflict society or a place that came out of conflict? I think it is the former, with some enduring hard edges. Surveys tell us in issues such as marriage equality, shared education, as I mentioned before, intercommunity marriage, the division is not, gen is not orange and green. The division is generational. But too many of us car away from seismic shifts that have taken place within our society. We will not catch the hearts and minds of most if we do not use such evidence to assert that cultural isolation and sectarianism are increasingly artificial. To paraphrase, the sectarian wheel that squeaks the most gets too much media oil. We will not have the unity of hearts and minds if we do not affect more pronounced and confident civic leadership. Those who understand culture as hybrid and multiply influenced must stand firmly for their broad and inclusive approach. I had an exchange with a friend who's a Republican who on the 13th of July kept sending me a text of drunken sectarian mayhem on the 12th. I asked him, you never sent any texts about the Tyrone GAA team and the sectarian behaviour that happened. And he replied, I was in the pub last night, the 12th, with my GIA friends, and the orange men came in, and there was no aggro and a nice feel about the night. I replied, why don't you text that and say it? Good point, he replied. The question is here is not that of balance or sectarian chess playing, but of not having the wherewithal or even thought to promote such a positive experience. To not put energy into the positive as opposed to mocking the other is not only problematic as it is selective, but to not even consider promoting an increasingly positive experience is plainly obdurate. In that sense, in this conversation, self due to challenge became there was no aggro and a nice feel about the night. That's the type of vocabulary that we need to capture. Now, I am somebody here from the PUL community. I'm Geoffrey tonight. And uh, I think one of the things that's really problematic in the whole issue about a united Ireland, so much of the debate about a united Ireland is about where will unionists be located? What is a united Ireland? What is it going to be? How is it going to function? Why is there constant fixation upon the unionist community as opposed to people drawing up plans and blueprints of what a united Ireland will be? It's not just about unionism. There's all sorts of things that we need to look at and we need to understand. Not all unionists wear sashes, wear bowler hats, a bit like Easter Sunday, the 12th does not draw everybody from within. These are maroonity pursuits, but they're presented as catch-all occasions. Most of cultural consumption, of course, is no violent, Netflix, and all sorts of ways in which people engage with culture. Culture is fluid, culture is frustrating, culture is liberating, but the one thing that the poet Aberjani tells us is that diversity is an aspect of human existence that cannot be eradicated by terrorism or war or self-consuming hatred. It can only be conquered by recognizing the wealth of values it represents for all. So we recently had a, a, an issue, I don't know if many of you picked up on it, with Singapore Air, Airlines that had a video which basically said Protestants couldn't do art, uh, Protestants made money, 
uh, Protestants were infused by the Bible, and Protestants were basically devoid of culture. This is the community that is more likely to assert that it is not religious. It is as likely as the nationalist community to support marriage equality. It is a community which is as likely to support mixed marriages. It is a community which is as likely to support integrated education. It is the community which is more supportive of abortion. So despite that evidence, we are constantly presented with this wearisome trope of cultural dysfunction and a lack of culture. Ultimately, if you're not prepared to investigate a culture and find its diversity, you probably forgo any right to comment on it. Even I recall when I hear people telling me that the community I come from is cultureless. Orange banners are redolent of art. Ruby Murray, George Best, Higgins, Van Morrison are all people of cultural genius and all cultural genius, genius, genii, who were tight working class broads. In the contemporary, Patterson, Bateman, Jones and Reed point to a vibrancy that emerges from PUL community backgrounds. One, the issue, of course, is not their background, or even if they would accept the label as being from the PUL community, but how they and their equivalent would prefer to be understood as broad cultural contributors. The trick of their art and their culture is that it enriches and upholds inter-community consumption. When we talk about hearts and minds, a lot of it's already there. We're just not talking about it enough. We're not placing it further into the public realm. Next week in Derry, the New Gate Festival, the Great of the London Derry Bands Forum, was played at the Ardesh, enters its most prolific year of PUL celebration and inter-community engagement. The Eastside Festival in Belfast does the same. The Fela, like those who can't events and occasions, will receive hardly any media attention over the next few weeks. But we will hear plenty about bonfires and marches. Why are we making a significant inter-community contribution so invisible? Why are we doing that? Why are we permitting that to happen? The best book I've read recently is Anna Byrne's book, Milkman. I'm going to spoil a wee bit of it. If you haven't read it, close your ears. The reason why I like reading Milkman so much is the protagonist, who I assume comes from Ardoin or some Republican area, is within her community not Republican enough. But when she leaves her area... She's too Republican. She simply wants to read books, learn French, and be herself. There's a scene in the book where a cat is blown up in a downtown bomb, and the politicians blame each other for such an indiscriminate act, only to find out that the poor Moggy died due to, due to an unexploded World War II bomb. Each is confident in blaming the other without fact. Byrne's novel is how we should remember a vital aspect of the conflict, cultural appropriation, labelling those who are not loyal enough, undermining their opportunity, and asserting culture as homogenous, all a reminder of how drearily depressing the conflict actually was. Another issue, of course, we're talking about is Brexit, and Brexit saw, and Jerry Carlyle's here tonight, uh, from the, civic, the growth in civic nationalism and events that were held. So we were told that Brexit was the game changer. Brexit was going to awaken the nationalist Republican community. Liberal unionists were starting to think about Irish unification. Then we had an election. Who succeeded in the election? The Alliance Party, the Greens, and people for profit. They were the parties that grew. So sometimes when we read situations, we might want to actually sense what really is happening, as, as, assumed, as assumed to predicting that things are happening in the ways that we think. Brexit may still be a game changer in terms of the constitutional issues. But the one thing that that election showed is that very few people are going to move away from their constitutional lineage. What's critically important to understand about Northern Ireland is these identities are things that we inherited. We might make them harder, we might make them softer, but few people pass across the Rubicon in terms of constitutional devotion. As the English philosopher Adam, Adam Watts reminds us, we seldom realise, for example, that our most private thoughts and emotions are not actually our own. For we think in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but which were given to us. So let's think about the pro-union community. Pro-union community has members which are, who are Catholic. It has members who are Protestants. It has members who are newcomers and migrants. It has 65% of those who do not express 
their religion. It's declining, but it's still robust. So if we're trying to think about hearts and minds, then maybe one of the things we have to accept if we're pro-Irish unification is that Northern Ireland may have a longer shelf life than you wish or that you assume. <laughs> I was worried. I thought it was last orders. <laughs> so what, what we actually... It's like when I got married to a Catholic and they rang the bell and all the pros ran out. Uh, so what we actually need is the embodiment of what is cultural value. For our opportunities in the talks that are taking place at the moment, there is a big opportunity here to do something critically important. One of the reasons why I voted for the Belfast Agreement was because of parity of esteem and mutual respect. We need to find in the talks that are taking place ways in which we put cultural value within parity of esteem and mutual respect. We have identities which are oppositional but they are full of cultural value, and they are greater cultural value if we understand that they're diverse. If we understand that they make a contribution. If we understand that it's not just bowler hats and lilies and poppies. There's much greater diversity. One of the people who spoke to you today is Linda Irvine. Linda Irvine is teaching Irish in a Protestant church in a loyalist area. That is progress. That is the sort of thing we have to do. So for our politicians, we have to understand that culture has instrumental value, it drives creative economies, it has health and emotional benefits, it's critically important for uh, disadvantaged areas. very interesting book came out last week about young men joining loyalist or orange flute bands. Why did half of them join? Because they thought it was a good way to meet girls. They had not considered it as any part of any identity or any culture. Culture has institutional value in terms of benefits for the public. It promotes the ethos of public service and is vital to trust. Our politicians, if there's going to be a hearts and minds strategy, if unionism wants to maintain the union, it has to understand that it has to have inter-community support. It has to locate cultural value more than a narrow understanding of unionism. If Republicans want the union in Ireland, they have to understand that unionism is not just Highland dancing and orange parades. They're economic, social. Our issues about pensions, these things are critically important. And to finish this, lampooning and shaming the hard edges will not resolve or dilute them. We must find ways to not only deliver hearts and minds, but first acknowledge that it is already growing. That approach needs nurture and public light of recognition. We must all come to celebrate with cultural hybridity and constitutional difference. I'm constitutionally British, but I'm culturally Irish. That's the diversity that we need to engage with. Remember that famous image when rugby was first played at Croke Park? The guy with the new foreign games wearing the Celtic shirt? <laughs> Cultural hybridity? Okay. So in shorthand, we have to get the agreement to work properly. We have to make parity of esteem and respect a cornerstone of the Northern Ireland Assembly. As Lord Barron reminds us, those who will not reason are bigots, those who cannot are fools, and those who dare not are slaves. Thank you.